wonder if you've ever heard the quote, leaders are made, they are not born. Leaders are made, they are not born. I have been reading a leadership book at the moment and I read through this quote and I thought it was really interesting because I notice um, my inclination and I'm not sure if anyone else here has this inclination to think that leadership is something that people are born with, that it's uh, a natural ability, that it's a natural part of their personality or it's a natural set of skills that they are born with. But when I read this quote, um, it reminds me that even though there are people who are born with natural leadership skills, there are people who are born with natural leadership ability and natural leadership potential, it doesn't mean that other people can't be leaders. And we can actually be made into leaders, that we can learn, that we can grow. For any of the teachers in the room or psychologists in the room, um, it's having a growth mindset and not having a fixed mindset. Not thinking, well, I was born this way, so I'm going to stay this way. But having a growth mindset and say, you know what? Yes, I may be born with limitations, but I can grow and I can change. And I'm not sure about you, but I know that I can also think to have this same thought when it comes to sharing, pe sharing with people about Jesus. You know, there's some people that we think, you know, they were just born to share Jesus with others. They were a born evan evangelist. How do I say that word? Evangelist. A born evangelist. <laughs> uh, I should have, I wrote evangelism, but I, I wrote it in the wrong tense type thing. You think that people are these born evangelists, that they're born with these natural skills and abilities and talents, and they are the people who should be sharing Jesus with others. But today, I want us together to challenge that type of thinking, to challenge that thinking and think, you know what, um, discipleship or teaching people about Jesus, it's not about being born in a particular way, but we can actually be made that way, that we can change, that this is something that we can learn. And today, I'm just going to finish with one question, one simple question. And if you can answer that question with a yes, then I want to tell you that you are here to show someone Jesus' love, that you are here to share with someone in your life about Jesus. But I'm not going to tell you that question yet. I'm going to make you listen to me for about another 18 minutes. Is that all right? <laughs> I'll try not to be too boring. All right, so but before we jump into today, I'll take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Rachel, if you are new, I'm the associate pastor here. Um, and I also want to have a quick chat about what Ryan spoke about last week. Ryan shared a great message with us and it focused around the passage um, from Luke chapter 10 verses 1 to 4. But he really brought out one section in that and it was this, it was the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Right, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And if you didn't get a chance to come along last Sunday, that is okay. But I hope that you take the time to jump on YouTube or jump on our website or jump on our app and have a listen to what Ryan had to say. Because I believe that it was quite timely. And Ryan drew the connection between when this verse was written, that actually in a similar context to what we are today, Sometimes we forget the hardship and the persecution, the difficulty that Jesus and the early church had when they were spreading the news about Jesus. You know, sometimes when you think about in reality, we have it a little bit easier. Yes, we might face some social persecution, but I don't know about anyone who's been crucified upside down because they've shared someone with Jesus. But that is what happened to the first disciples. And so he spoke about how we are actually in a similar time where it is difficult for different reasons, for different reasons, but it is difficult to share Jesus with other people. But back then, the word was the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And right now, that word is still true. That even though um, belief in Christianity, that following Jesus is at a decline, that actually means there's more potential Right, when Ryan said that, I don't think he said it in his message, but I think he said it to me in the week sometime. And I thought, oh gosh, yeah, duh. If there's less people following Jesus, it means that the harvest is bigger. There is more people to harvest because if everyone was following Jesus, there would be no harvest. And I just want to take some time to affirm this. 
You know, for me in my own life, a, a particular calling or a challenge that I've always had is that I should be intentional and that my family should be intentional about building relationships with non-Christian people. Building relationships with non-Christian people because I believe that a relationship is such a great platform for mission, right? That relationship is such a great platform for mission. And I think sometimes it's too easy in our church setting to hang around with the people who believe the same things as we do and act the same way we do. It can be really quite confronting when you have close friendships with people who believe in the complete opposite thing that you do and perhaps behave in a complete opposite way that you behave. But I really believe that this is a mission field for us, that our friendships and our relationships outside of church are important and it is a great opportunity. And so as I've gone on this journey, let me tell you the amount of people that have asked me about Jesus, right? People are curious. They are curious. Sometimes it takes a couple of alcoholic drinks to let the curiosity rise to the surface. But people are curious about God. They're curious about Jesus. They're curious about the afterlife. And if you actually sit in a space with them and give them time, they will ask you the questions. You know, it wasn't that long ago we went to the pub after um, one of Kaylin's um, football games. And I, and I don't kid you, but I ended up being in a conversation where I had about 10 people listening about Jesus, about who he is, about how we believe in him. And I was just sitting there thinking, oh gosh, I'm in a pub, like, but we're talking about Jesus. How cool is this? Right? The harvest is plentiful. The harvest is plentiful. And the question for us is thinking, well, the work is a few, so how do we partake in that? And so now we need to decide, are we willing to go out into the fields, right? Are we willing to go out into the fields? If there is a harvest to be had, will we go and get it? And so to dig into this a little bit deeper, I would love for us to look at the story in the Bible. I'm sure lots of us are familiar with it. Um, It's when Jesus feeds the 5,000. Do you guys know that story? Yes. Well, I used to be in kids all the time, so I think I've read this story about a thousand times. But it is found in all four of the Gospels. But today we're going to look at um, John chapter 6, verses 1 to 14. And as we read through this together, I want you uh, to listen out for some of the characters that we hear. Okay, so I want you to listen for some of the characters that we hear. And I want you to note, what is their response in the story? And then after we've read the passage, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. And so this is what it says. It says, sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for all of these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wage to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. He said, Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled the baskets with the, sorry, they filled 12 baskets with the pieces of five barely loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountainside by himself. And so I'm not sure um, if you heard some of the characters' names, but one of the first characters that we heard about was uh, Andrew. No, sorry, Philip, 
right? And this is how Philip responds. He said, it would take more than half a year's wage to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. And I love how it said, you know, Jesus asked Philip this question, but he knew exactly where he was going, but he was curious about what Philip's response was going to be. And when we look at Philip's response, he responds with complete reason, complete logic, right? He has Jesus who has performed some miracles, right? He hasn't, I would say Jesus is in his warm-up stage of performing miracles, okay? He's um, made water into wine. He's healed some people. He hasn't quite pulled out the big guns of raising people back to life or walking on water. That's coming next, right? But they've seen Jesus do some pretty miraculous things. And so Jesus asked Philip this question, how are we going to feed these people? And Philip responds with reason and with logic. And he says it would take half a person's yearly wage. So if we put that into today's context, right, the average wage for an Australian is about $90,000. And so that would be like someone saying to us, you know, here is all these people to eat, you need to get $45,000. And then you need to turn that $45,000 into actual food, and then you need to feed them. And Philip's response is, this is impossible. This cannot be done. Jesus, you are crazy. We cannot do this. Right? And then we have this next character. We have Andrew, okay? And he's Simon Peter's brother. And he said, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But then he says, but how far will they go among them? And it's interesting, as I play this story out in my head, right, I could imagine um, Andrew seeing this boy and seeing the loaves and thinking, well, there's something here. And then he looks at Jesus and he's like, well, here we've got something. Maybe it's possible. And he's looking at Jesus and thinking, you know what, maybe we can do this. But then all of a sudden, he looks out to the crowd And he sees the thousands of thousands and thousands and thousands of people to feed. And then he thinks, wait a minute, this isn't going to work. It's not going to be enough. We surely, we can't feed all these people with these five loaves of bread and these two fish. And then so we have this one other character that we can look into and we see this little boy This small boy, and we doesn't go into great detail about what the boy was thinking or what he was feeling. But what we do know is that this little boy took his two fish and his five loaves of bread. Right, food that what I'm assuming was going to feed him for the day or feed his family for the day. That's all he had. But this little boy took what he had in his hands and he gave it to Jesus. Right, this little boy took what he had in his hands, the little that he had, the insignificant amount that he had, and he handed it to Jesus. And then we read on and we see what happens. Right? We see what does Jesus do with this? What does Jesus do with this response? What does Jesus do when this little boy came to him with not much but faith and willingness And so Jesus took the two fish and the five loaves of bread. And the first thing that he did, I don't know if you caught it, but the first thing that he did is he gave thanks for them. Right? Jesus didn't go, first thing, God, there's definitely not enough here. But, you know, come on, do something with it. He didn't look at it and go, oh, gosh, this isn't going to work. Or even for a moment, doubt. The first thing he did is he took what he had in his hands, and he gave thanks to God for what he had. And then he worked with the disciples. He handed the food out to the disciples. It doesn't say it quite in this passage, but if you look at the other um, Gospels, is that we know that Jesus didn't do this all on his own, but he actually worked with the disciples, and he handed out these two fish and five loaves of bread, and they fed not just 5,000 people, right, because it said 5,000 men. And there was no such thing as contraception in those days, right? So it means there was probably lots of children, right? Lots of children were there and there was the women, okay? And so Jesus feeds and the disciples feed, what, 10,000, 12,000? I don't know, but thousands and thousands and thousands of people with this small amount of food. Jesus made the impossible possible. 
And it didn't matter about what he was given. It didn't matter about the resources that he had in his hands. It didn't matter about the quantity and the quality of the food. Right? All that mattered was that this boy was willing to give Jesus the little that he had. And the other thing that I note in this story is that shift with the disciples. Right at the start of the story, the disciples are acting in doubt. They're asking questions. They're going, this can't happen. We don't believe. And you know that sort of like, oh, maybe we do believe, but then look out into the world and see the big problems in front of us. And no, 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 this can't happen. This is how the disciples were responding first. And I love how this little child sort of instigated the change, instigated the shift. Because the disciples then decided to choose to work alongside with Jesus. And I wonder, I wonder what happened to change that? What happened to change the disciples going from doubt into faith? Because as far as we can tell in the story, right, their resources didn't increase. The story didn't say, well, the fish multiplied and the bread multiplied and then they went out and handed out the food. Right, so their resources didn't change. Right, I don't think a whole bunch of extra people rocked up. Their staffing didn't change. There wasn't all these extra hands ready to help. It was still Jesus and the 12 disciples. You know, and I don't think that they're planning. It, I, I, it doesn't say it, but I don't think they took a six-hour break to have a planning meeting. Right, to sit down and go, okay, how are we going to organize this? We have 10,000 mouths to feed. We have five bread five bread and two fish. I'm surprised I haven't got that mixed up yet. I was like thinking I'm so going to get that mixed up. All right, we had five bread and two fish. Let's make a plan. Let's make a strategy. Let's make sure we feed all these people. There was no planning that took place, right? And there was not an increase in skill set. The disciples didn't go out and do a short course on hospitality, right? They didn't invite a guest chef in to sort of teach them how do we feed this many people with this little amount of food. None of that changed there was one thing that changed one thing and that was their willingness it was their willingness to say yes to Jesus and so my one question for you today can you bring someone to Jesus can you share with someone about Jesus can you just help someone get one little step closer to Jesus? I'm not going to ask you about, well, what's your skill set? I'm not going to ask you how long have you been a Christian? I'm not going to say, well, have you got a team of people around you? Do you have someone to pray for you? Um, do you have the gift of tongues or the gift of prophecy? Do you have the gift of preaching or teaching? They are none of the questions that I'm going to ask you today. The one question I'm going to ask you is, are you willing Right? Are you willing? Because that is the only thing that matters. That is the only thing that matters. Because you, I'm asking you, are you willing to work with Jesus? Right? And it actually doesn't matter about you. It doesn't matter about your capacity or your skill set or your natural ability. You are working alongside Jesus. The Jesus who performed miracles, who healed the blind, who healed the sick, who brought Lazarus back from the dead, who turned water into wine. We are working with Jesus and all he needs is our willingness. All he needs is our willingness. And so I wonder, I wonder, are you willing to step out into the harvest fields just as the disciples stepped out into the fields to feed the 5,000? Will you believe just like that little boy that the little you have to offer your five loaves of bread and your two fishes, will you believe that it's enough to satisfy the hunger of this world? Right? Will you choose to not look at the resources that you have, the team of people around you, the skill set that you have or the plan that you have? Right? Will you just look to Jesus and know that he is with you, that he is beside you? And can you say, I am willing? right? I am willing. And as we head into a time of application, I want to give you guys a few steps that you can take. If you want to say, yes, Jesus, I'm willing. I want to work with you. I want to give you a starting point. 
Okay, and the first thing that I want to talk about is this idea of repentance. You know, because I know for me that there are times where there's this like unwillingness in my heart to share the gospel, right? Whether it's this wall that's up or it's this refusal. And I don't know where that comes from. Does that come from a fear or an insecurity? But I wonder, church, if there are times when we have been unwilling to share the gospel. And maybe we need to spend some time repenting of that and saying, Jesus, I am sorry for being unwilling at times. I am sorry for looking at the world and not looking at you. I'm sorry for looking at what's in my hands and not into your eyes. I'm sorry that I've been unwilling in the past, but I want to become willing. Help me to become willing. And I want to give you one thing to remember. If there is one thing that you can remember from this message today, and I'm sort of stealing um, Vince Lombardi's quote, so don't tell him. He's probably dead, I think. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) But it's this, right? Disciples are made, they are not born. Right? Let's get that out of our head. Let's get that out of our thinking. Let's get that out of our DNA. Let's stop thinking that you have to be a special type of person to share Jesus with other people. Right, if you are in this room, if you believe in Jesus, if you are willing, then that's on you. That's your job. Jesus wants you to share with others about him and about his love. Right, Disciples are made. They are not born. And just like anything we do, right? First thing we do something, it's usually really, really hard. I'm trying to think of something that's really, lots, everything's really hard when I first do it. I'm not like very natural at things. But let's say parenting, right? No, that stays hard. I'll take that back. (laughs) I take that back. Let's say kicking a soccer ball. I don't know, right? When you first learn a sport or a skill, it's usually really hard and it doesn't work and you kick the ball and it only goes one metre. But then you practice it and practice it. My dad's here. We said much, many, many hours practicing kicking a soccer ball. And the more you practice it, the easier it becomes. And before you know, you can play a game. I actually was not very good at kicking a soccer ball. I don't have lots of natural power and natural ability. But, you know, it was something that I practiced and something that I worked on. And I definitely didn't become a superstar at it. <laughs> but I got better. And it's the same with sharing Jesus with other people. It is a skill, right? And yes... People might be born with more of a natural ability. You might look at some people and think, wow, they just did that so well. But do you know what the chance is? The chance is that it's not their first time. Right? It's not their first time. And you probably didn't see their first time, but the first time they did it, they were probably really, really bad at it. And you're just seeing the like 10th time or the 50th time. And you're thinking, wow, that person is so good. He's so awesome. They have such a natural ability. But they probably have actually just practiced it. Right, so disciples are made, they are not born. We can all do it, church. And I want to give you one way to respond, right? One way to respond. And um, sitting on some of your seats is um, a little leaflet thingy. Um, if you don't have one that's near you, there's a few spare ones left over on the info desk. I know um, as I was handing them out, I'm probably thinking, man, there's going to be some kids that turn these into paper airplanes or scribble sheets. So <laughs> you might need to go over to the info desk. But church, my challenge for us this week is to wake up each morning and to say this prayer, right? It's thank you, Lord, for what I have in my hands today, right? Not saying it's not enough, it's not good enough, but thanking God for what he has given you in your hands today. And please work in your miraculous way to use what I have to bring someone closer to you. Right, work in your miraculous way. Right, Jesus fed 5,000 men plus their women and their children with five loaves of bread and two fish. Right, he can work miraculously in and through you to help someone get closer to him. You know, and imagine, church, imagine if each and every single one of us here woke up every single day and started our day with that prayer. I wonder how many more people would come to know Jesus. I love what Ryan said last week about how for each of us, you know, the reason why we know Jesus is because of somebody else, right? Somebody said something to us or someone prayed for us or someone showed the love of Jesus to us, 
right? Imagine if we all start our day like this. And church, imagine, imagine a church full of people that responded to Jesus with these three words, I am willing. I am willing. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the love that you had. Lord, we just thank you that you have worked in all of our lives. Lord, that we can trust you and that we can follow you. And Lord, I just want to say thank you for everything that you have given us. Dear Lord, that each of us has something in our hands. And to us, it might seem small. But Lord, I know that to you, it's all that we need. That you have given us exactly what we need. And so, Lord, we ask that you help work in each of our hearts to have a heart of willingness to say yes to you, to look to you and to not to the world, to have the courage and the bravery to go out into the fields. Lord, may we be a church full of people who are willing to follow you and the calling that you have on our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.